Good morning, all. Thank you for joining us. The first thing Lee Beatty told me about herself was that she is a person who always looks towards a solution. Her and I have that in common. And uh, some of you might have actually been able to witness it. We were having some connectivity issues and she dove right into her settings and fixed it up and you see her slides she's created today. So I am very pleased to, to uh, introduce Lee and uh, hear her discuss customer journey mapping and its role in website design and creation. Let's give it up, guys. Thank you. As uh, was mentioned, my name is Lee Beatty, and I am with a group called Four Chicks with a Website. We started off as working together for another digital agency, and we found that we had a philosophical difference with our previous employer. We were all subcontractors. But what we found was they were taking on what I'll call cheap websites and not delivering high quality results. And we didn't like that. We felt we had a better way. So we went out, joined together. We're located in uh, Toronto, New Hampshire. I'm in Tucson, and one of our um, partners is in Fort Worth, Texas. So we're kind of all over the place. To give you a little bit about, how come it's not? OK, it is not. Moving forward. Here's my tech guy here, because it's showing up on the screen. Let me restart. Let's look at the displays because it. Yeah, you close them. Okay, let's. There. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Give a hand for the tech support. As you're going to find out, I am not the technical one in our group. Um, personally, I've been married many, 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 many years. And as I was explaining to uh, Claudia, um, we have an anniversary coming up in March. We'll have been married 50 years. <laughs> Two children, three grandchildren, all in college. We enjoy hiking, biking, and jeeping. We live in Tucson, but you know, it gets a little warm there come about June. And we have a motor home, so we head north for four months. Um, professionally, I'm one of the founders of Four Chicks. I've been around for a little while, uh, since 1994, when my husband and I set up one of, uh, our first website was as a travel and tourism portal in Colorado. And I love keeping up with technology, and I've done this continuously ever since. 
And as such, I've been around for a long time. And I want to give just a little bit of, of history here at the beginning, because in the beginning, the year was 1989, and this was a website. Now, many of you are very young, don't maybe remember these. They were text-based based with links. We loved them because we could spend hours going from link to link to link to link. We called it surfing the web. Then in the 1990s, um, we had more tools for development of websites. And in fact, what the interesting thing is, in 1994, there were actually fewer than 3,000 websites worldwide. Let's fast forward into the 2000s. Flash became real popular, more of a, of a user interface that they could get excited about. But the thing I wanted to point out is by 2014, there were more than one billion websites. And that's a 33 billion percent increase in just that short period of time. So that's left us with a reality today. And the reality is that emails flood our inboxes. Everybody agree? Okay. So what that means is I don't need your frickin' newsletter. Okay. Don't ask me to opt in for it. We're bombarded with ads. You go on Amazon, you look for something, and the next thing you do, you see it in your news feeds. You see it on YouTube. You see it in Facebook. I don't care where, but we're always being bombarded with ads. Another fact, competition for eyeballs has become very fierce. And the price of ads is going, it's skyrocketing right now. Absolutely going crazy. Tried to tell that to a client who was told just a couple, three years ago that they could get a lead for 25 cents. Also, people no longer surf for information. They are now going online looking for a specific answer to a problem. It's a research tool for most of us. Their other thing is, don't waste my time if you don't have what I'm looking for. Now, I read a stat that said you have eight seconds to get them to make a decision or they'll bail out. Personally, in what I've been seeing, looking at stats, it's closer to three to five seconds. So when someone lands on a website, if you don't show that you have what they're looking for, they'll bail. That bounce rate. Another thing is, over the years, the internet has become a place of distrust. Fake news, bad uh, press on bad products, people selling things that didn't really pan out to uh, do what they wanted to do. So trust is a real issue for people looking at, um, at websites these days. And then lastly, but it's an important aspect, is that internet usage has become more mobile, fast, uh, mobile focused. No longer are we just sitting around with desktops. I mentioned I travel in a motorhome, and what do I use? I use a Surface Pro, I use a Kindle, I use my smartphone, uh, and I have an iPad, so. Now the interesting thing is, is that in January 2018, Netcraft survey said that there were over 1.8 billion websites. However, most of those get almost no visitors. So, what does a business need to do to make their mark on the internet? There are four things that I just off the top of my head thought of. The first thing is they need to have a marketing strategy to drive the right kind of traffic to their website. They need to have a website that's been designed not to be just pretty, but to be conversion focused. As a previous speaker spoke, they want, res if the um, customer, if our customer wants results, they need to be conversion focused. Third thing that has happened. How many of you signed up for newsletters four years ago? Okay, many of us, we get inundated. And then the next thing, they want you to buy their $3,000 course. In this day and age, because of the trust issues, because of the cost of, of monies and such, we've learned that you need to date the prospect, not rape them. So this requires trying to nurture them as a potential client over time. And lastly, if you treat your prospects right, 
They'll come back and buy more and more from you, and they will refer their friends. But what I want to focus on today is a little bit about website design and how this all fits into this process. Okay, how many of you have had a customer come to you and they say, my website sucks? Well, that can mean a lot of different things. And so what we do is we go through a process where we try to ask them questions so that we can determine what is um, the situation that they have right now, what is their motivation, what outcome do they want, how is it going to make them feel afterward, and then how will others see them? And so, for example, in probably 90% of the people who come to us with a sucky website, they say that my website sucks, I want a redesign so that I can look better and convert more leads, it'll make me feel proud of my brand and confident, and it will, others will see me as driving my business forward. There are some additional challenges that we have these days. Originally, um, when people started building websites in the 90s, what were they? They were online brochures. How many of you, as a designer, maybe you've had people come in with their brochure and say, I want to be online. And they wanted it to look just like it did on the piece of paper and trying to explain to them about how things kind of shift and then add mobile. <laughs> so the thing that we tell our prospects who are looking for us to define a solution, to get them results, is they need to start looking into the minds of their prospects. Got to get into them. So why does a prospect come to a website and Im immediately move on to a different website? Why do they spend time browsing, and even perhaps if you have a cart, adding something to the cart and then bailing out, abandoning the cart? Why does a prospect take several steps to get from point A to point B, what you think is a simple, straightforward progression, but they go all over the place? And by the way, if you haven't put a heat map on your website or video tracings, it'll tell you some interesting things about the people. But what we do is at Four Chicks, we use a customer journey. And we use the customer journey is the process by which a prospect interacts with the company and their website in order to achieve a goal. Now, we can simplify this journey as three stages. Stage one is awareness. Somebody comes to your site. Don't know how they got there. Somebody may have referred them. They may have found you on a, on a search. Who knows? May have come to a talk. Then they have to consider you. And lastly, they have to be able to make a decision. So when we look at the journey simplified, we ask who is the target prospect and what is their pain? Why did they come to that website? For consideration, what is it that the client, our client, offers that can address the pain of his prospect? And then lastly, how does the website help that process or help that prospect make their final decision to buy. At Four Chicks, we use a, a six-stage, a six-phase process. And the first phase we call, by the way, for those who were here for the earlier talk, we do talk with the clients and kind of uh, pre-qualify them. But when we think that they're serious, we go through a very extensive discovery phase. And by the way, it is paid because we find that most clients haven't really thought through what they're really wanting to do and why they're doing it. So we have a discovery phase, followed by then the documentation, also writing up the specs, um, the design, the development, the deployment, and maintenance. But today I want to focus on this discovery portion because that, to us, has turned out to be the key. And for us, we'll have several exercises that may take place over multiple calls, multiple days. And in the first exercise, we ask our prospect or our client, what is it that you're selling? What specific products or services? 
Are there competitors? Is there a market? Have you ever had a client who came to you disappointed because he wasn't selling, but what he had was a product for which there was no need? We've seen that. Then, um, so research, is there actually a market? And what are your price points? By the way, I'm going through these slides fairly quickly, even faster now that we had a little technical glitch. I will show you at the end uh, a URL where you can get copies of these slides, so not a problem. Once we have the answers to that, then we go to exercise two, and that's defining the target audience, sometimes known as the personal persona or a co customer avatar, the ideal client. I don't care what you call them. Who are you trying to get to purchase your product or service? I think everyone's familiar with demographic information. What becomes more important, though, are the psychographics. That's kind of getting into the habits, the hobbies, the values, the interests that these prospects have. The goals and challenges and pain points that these prospects have. What are they looking for? What stands in the way of them accomplishing them? What keeps that prospect up at night? Another thing are the objections and the role in the process, in the purchase process. Why wouldn't your ideal prospect buy from you or hire you? And more important, too, is how much power does that one person have in the ultimate decision? How many of you have had, had an individual come to you only to find out later that there's a committee behind them? Lastly, the media use, this ideal client. Where does he get his or her information? Where do they gather, both online and off? What are their favorite websites, books, influencers, social media, and so forth? What are we gathering here? For anyone who does ads, you're getting the information you need to create target audiences for ads. Don't go out and just spend lots of money on too wide of a target. This is letting, letting you focus, and it makes us, as a de developer, makes our client have to focus on what he truly thinks. Have you had the client that comes in and he says, uh, when we ask, well, who's the for? Everybody. Everybody should want this. Bullshit. Just doesn't work that After we've gone through this persona, what we do for the client as a delivery point is we give them a one sheet um, that tells them about the persona, the insights, what will drive their actions, what their goals are, their decision process, and the barriers. What does this then provide? It provides us with the key words to be using in copy, and it provides us with the things that we should put on sales pages and target copy. How are we going to grab that person's attention and keep them? You can look at this in the, in the slides later in more detail. The third exercise we put them through, and sometimes by this time, by this time, sometimes if they say, you know, this isn't for me, that's fine. I don't want them as a client because they're not ready for us. They can go to Upwork. They can go and do their own Wix site. I don't care. Okay. But the next thing we do is we ask them and we develop a value proposition. Think of it as kind of the before and after state for a prospect. That is, what it should answer is it should answer the questions why someone should do business with them. It would include things like um, make it easy for people to find you, explain how your product resolves the pain, um, it would be displayed prominently on the website. It answers the question, if I'm your ideal customer, why should I buy from you instead of one of your competitors? So this is also part of this discovery process. Now with a value proposition, we have a canvas. And this is kind of where you, the rubber meets the road. You have a product or service on the left-hand side, and the, our customers perception of what their product or service does as far as features, benefits, and their experience. On the right-hand side, we look at the actual customer or the prospect. What is it that they actually want, fear, or need? Because if the 
website doesn't address that, it's not a good fit for that target persona. In which case, maybe you need to rethink who you're trying to sell to and why. It may turn out that you need several pages for several different types of ideal clients. They don't all have the same needs and requirements. And yet your project or your product may address them. So it's simple and it's a very important to know who your customer's ideal prospect is, what his lifestyle looks like, and what his real needs are. If you don't know your customers, and this is what we tell our people um, who come to us, if you don't know who your customers are, there may be a misfit for your product or service. For many of them, that's a new, a new um, exercise that they haven't really been through. And then if we look at the, um, the journey itself, then we look at the buyer journey. The, taking them from awareness of that product or service to interest. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Desire to have it. To considering, yeah, you know, this may be good, and then to making a decision. And so for an example, okay, we sometimes refer to it as the bait hook reel and boat approach. We bait them with what are the key questions that are going to be asked? And what is the right content to answer each one of these questions? That's to help make this prospect aware. The hook, what can you offer that would be irresistible to that target customer? And what would not only be, um, if I could read better, what would not only be, um, what would they be excited to download? off of your website to get to know you a little bit better. That's why I say, don't offer them a newsletter. Offer them something tangible that they can get to know you and your product and your service a little bit better. Once you get their name and email address, then comes the nurturing sequence. You reel them in through a series of emails and other uh, ways of going um, and of reaching out to them. And these could be everything from, um, uh, from webinars. Uh, we sometimes call it the soap opera sequence of emails to kind of date them, to let them tr uh, trust you, and so forth. Then the boat is what's the best way to help the customers understand the value of what you offer. Think of this as, um, Telling them about other people who have taken up your offer. How have they gained? The testimonials, the results, the befores and afters. And then lastly, giving them the opportunity to actually buy with a call to action. What this then leads us to is to brainstorm then how and what we're going to need for the website. So for example, how many of you have heard of lead magnets? Okay, that's that ethical bribe that you're going to use to try to get the name and email from a prospect so that you can continue to nurture them and hopefully sell them a product down the road. It could be um, oh, some kind of template or a cheat sheet. Uh, it might be a toolkit. These are the tools I use, blah, blah, blah. It could be a freebie that says, this is the ultimate guide to. I think all of you have probably seen these offer offers. Nine steps to, you know, whatever it is. It might be inviting them to a what's working now webinar. These are all versions of lead magnets. And we talk to the client about what they currently have or what they could develop easily to start this as a process. Then we look at um, what we call the belief bridge. The little known and the big differences or what they're suffering and trying to struggle to overcome. How they'd feel before or after and how this is going to change everything if it's, if it's a life-changing product. Then we want to encourage trust. What are the triggers? Um, 
through emails, through um, testimonials, you can encourage their dreams, you can justify their failures, you can allay their fears, you can throw rocks at their enemies. And then we offer um, sometimes a splinter solution. Sometimes you do a, a trial sell. You sell a little product at $4.95 just to find out, are they willing to, at this point, after you've nurtured them, willing to part with a little bit of money? Because if they're willing to part with a little bit of money, then they're going to be far greater likely to part with bigger monies down the road. Because what you really want to get to is that core offer, what you actually sell. This then leads us to a typical um, list of the pages that we're actually going to need for the website, the offers that will be presented, once again following the awareness, interest, consideration, and decision journey for that customer. Now, traditional site maps have looked like this. You have a home page, and all that home page about us, contact me, uh, the products that you offer, news or my blog, maybe you have a shop, and you have maybe multiple blog posts. And then under products, you may have three different products or whoever, whatever af after that. But the thing in this model, and the reason why it's not working as effectively nowadays, is that this is all about the business and not the prospect. The prospect doesn't see himself in this model. But what if we turn it to a website design built to convert prospects into buyers? And in this example, you have a home page. But you may offer on that home page a couple of opt-ins. Maybe it's a calculator. Maybe it's a quiz to find out a little bit more about them. You might even have three areas. If you have more than one target audience, have three different areas where you can target and, and start to differentiate and to uh, segment these prospects into the different areas that they are. You can then still talk about your products, but then think about trust values. Your process. How do you do business? People like to know how you do business. Your people, if there's more than just one. If there's just one, they want to know about you. If they're buying you, they want to know about you. They might want to know about the company and contact forms. And then at the bottom, footer information with uh, your social media links. So this is a typical um, conversion-based website design. And what I wanted to do quickly was to give you a few examples to show you how this can be done effectively. And this is a lady by the name of Amy Porterfield. Very, very, very successful lady. And this is the top part of her website. You'll notice that she's selling herself. And she's telling who she's for, and let's get started. And then as you scroll down, she says, download one of my powerful cheat sheets. And those cheat sheets are I need a list, I need a product, I need to sell more. She's trying to relate to individuals. She will get their information from that. Then she has her trust factors down below. Another, this is a coach, Suzanne Evans. And Suzanne Evans is interesting. You notice that she doesn't put her menu right up with all the other navigations because she wants people to focus on a certain set. She tells them exactly what she wants them to do in the design of this website. She says, businesses don't run out of money, they run out of ideas, download my guide. And then as you scroll down, you'll find, okay, if you don't wanna go through the guide, you wanna talk to someone, she has a call to action, talk to a coach. She has her, um, uh, her credits and her um, other things that tell you about why you should want to work with her, including blog, and then again at the bottom, how to connect. But these are also, the same rules can apply even if you have a, uh, a business, like a car dealership. Think about what the customer wants. In this case, they want to know 
what can they buy, what inventory is in stock, where can they go see it? And so the design of the site gives them all this kind of options. And this is all in one on the first page. Now, I'm running out of time here, but I was just going to say that this approach changed how Four Chicks with, a, uh, Chicks with a Website does business. What we did is, before we uh, did this, we were working with groups that they would charge between $500 and $5,000 to build a website. You build it, and then they were gone. Okay. We don't build websites now. We partner with our customers to build in solutions. We tell them immediately that our websites start at $5,000, and that's for a single page sales page. We develop a partnership with the client, and our initial project proposals average $10,000 to $25,000, and if they're e-commerce or membership sites, we specialize in membership and e-learning courses. They're even higher. We worry and we get more monies by recurring revenue from website care plans because we're partnering with our prospect. And we get recurring revenue for marketing strategy assistance. We've become a partner in their business. Now, we tend to deal with small to mid-sized entrepreneurs who don't have marketing teams, who don't have lots of people, but they could be making multiple millions of dollars a year, but they need help to grow. What has happened to us? We started in June of last year. Right now, our referrals have skyrocketed. We onboard new clients only twice a month, and we tell them, you sign on the dotted line now, and we can start on the 15th. You don't, the next date is the 1st of March. So that's how we've done. I just wanted to share this information with you because I think it's been very valuable. And if you want a copy of this presentation, you can go to fourchickswithawebsite.com slash wordcamp dash phoenix. Do I have time for questions or am I out? Do I have time? OK. Questions? Nobody has questions. Yes? How would you suggest people do this who are selling themselves on a website and leveraging that against buyers? The question was, how would I uh, approach people selling themselves? You're the product. Versus biases? Can you give me an example? Sure. Racist. Racist. Who's your target market? <laughs> if your tar he said, I asked him who his target market was. He said, those people. Um, that's going to be a hard sell. And maybe that's not your best target market. Because you're going to, you have to decide, are you going to put the effort f forth to try to change their minds. And racism in general is very deeply entrenched. Why don't you go for lower hanging fruit? What kind of, uh, he asked, uh, he said, my target market is small businesses. What kind of small businesses? All small. That's not a good answer. Okay, all the businesses in a community. So, so if you have your website, you have a page on it, then you have these groups. Then if you are concerned, don't sell it as you. Sell it as your business. You don't have to have a picture of you on there, okay? Um, and sell your expertise and nurture them with your expertise. Then who cares? About the other. But even then, if you're in a large community and you're trying to sell, you might want to niche it down a little bit more. You might want to niche it for um, used car dealers. 
as a starting point. You might want to niche it for restaurants. You might want to niche it for something a little more focused because the pains that a, that a car dealership have are different than the pains that a restaurant owner has, are different than the pains that uh, someone selling clothing have. And so you as one person or even as one agency, you can't be all to everybody. You need to find and to direct. You may have to have and send them to specific pages that talk about their pain. Another question? Okay, well, oh, yes, in the back. The question was, what if your client doesn't know where the customers are getting their information, how they can reach them? That's where you come in to do research. And that's why we do paid discoveries. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll ask them, well, do you have existing clients? And then you can go, um, you know, it's real easy on the internet to do research on, uh, you know, who the influences are, um, who they might be following. You can actually get on their Facebook profile and so many of them don't have anything locked down and you can find out who they're already following, okay? Um, it takes a little more, but I use tools. There are a number of various tools. I use SEMrush as one of the tools to do research. Uh, I, use, um, uh, I use my web audit as a tool that has been very valuable. I used automated tools to reduce the amount of personal time I have to spend looking those up. And I think that that's key in this day and age, is that if you want to keep your profit margins and not eat into them, and we all know you can go down a rabbit hole and spend hours and hours and not get anything out of it. That's why if a client cannot tell me, I'll do a, a uh, actually what I'll do too, is I find out who his competitors are. And if he doesn't know, you can use like SEMrush as one of the examples, there are other tools too, to find out who are his competitors, whether he knows it or not. And then find out where they say. You can use a tool like SEMrush. I don't know, how many of you have used SEMrush? Okay, you know, you can get in there and you can see how much that competitor's paying for ads, what their keywords are, all this stuff. Use it for your client. It'll make you look real smart. And a, as a hero or a heroine in this case. Any other questions? I use my web audit. Actually, we use my web audit as a qualification tool. Um, someone comes and they say, my website sucks. We run them through. All we do is we ask them, a, uh, I think the previous, uh, Duane was asking people, how long is your intake form, or how long do you qualify them? We have like five questions max on our intake, and we ask them for a URL, we run, run it through a web audit, and then we don't tell them what their goals are, we tell them what they should be. So we take control from the very start. And we come out looking good, and that's why they then pay us rather than doing it themselves or hiring their brother's nephew, or brother's girlfriend's father, okay? Uh-huh. So your business ran more like you guys were project lead, do you outsource to others, or? The question was, do we outsource or do we do everything? We don't do everything ourselves. Uh, as I mentioned, we have one person whose specialty is e-learning and membership and the user interfaces. Uh, I have a programmer developer slash she codes and does plugins, but um, and we hire out and do everything from graphics, copywriting, SEO, those kind of things. We can't do it all, but if we have a client that needs it, we have. We've been. I've been doing this a long time, so I have a lot of, of people. But we're also looking for good people to partner with on these um, on these projects because we don't do it all ourselves. Yes. Used a couple of, he asked about heat maps. I've used a couple of heat maps. So there is the Sumo Me one. I also have used the one, True Conversion, uh, which is one from, uh, that one of the partners at Digital Marketer helped develop. It, the advantage of, um, of the True Conversion is it not only does heat maps, but it also will create a video of where people go. And it's kind of interesting to see 
It's not just they hit this, they hit this, they hit this. It's what order they do, because you can actually see. And that's where you can, uh, you can really see confusion in a prospect. And it shows that they don't know what direction. You've given them too many choices, or they can't find what they're looking for. So, any other questions? Well, I'm around through lunch, and then um, if you have any questions, you can also uh, reach me at fourchickswithawebsite.com. Thank you.